Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and in today's video, I want to talk to you and answer. And in today's video, I want to answer the most common question I get, which is, regardless of what the specific role, what do I need to focus on, Brian? What do I need to learn? I hear there are gobbledygook this and technical stuff that. What do I need to focus on? Because everybody's pushing whatever the latest thing is, and I get confused. What should I do? So I'm going to answer that question right now. And I want to start by prefacing, as usual, I like to do a sort of conceptual framework that I lay down so that I'm not just answering one question, but I'm giving you the tools so that you can figure this out regardless of the specific role you're trying to move into. So let's start with what I call the core knowledge. If you're going to be, for instance, a Python developer, just to throw it out there, then you're going to obviously have to know a lot about Python, right? So your core subject area has to be Python. You should know Python, the language well, know how to do objects and classes and all the different variable types and on and on. You have to know Python well. Now, beyond knowing Python, you get into other things, which I call the correlated knowledge. So maybe there's some libraries and things that you don't always use but would be good to know. Now depending on what type of Python developer, maybe you want to know Streamlit, maybe you don't. Maybe you need to know some things about how to use Python in certain environments like Linux or the cloud. So that would be what I would call the correlated knowledge. The core knowledge is the Python itself. You have to be really solid. If you're going to interview to be a Python developer, well, you better know your Python. You better be ready to answer a lot of questions about that. But if somebody started asking you questions about Java, well, you might know a little about that, but it's not part of your core subject area, clearly. So again, you've got your core area and correlated knowledge. Outside of that, you have what I call domain ancillary knowledge. So again, I'll kind of use the Python developer, though that's a very sort of weakly defined role. But domain ancillary knowledge might be things like knowing things about DuckDB, relational databases, and things like that. Depending on what exactly you intend to do as a Python developer, the ancillary knowledge will be different. But you'll notice it's not Python. It's topics that get away from Python, but are related enough that you'll probably need to know them. Another way to look at this is core knowledge is something you will need every day on your job. The correlated knowledge is something you'll probably need many days of your job. And the domain ancillary knowledge is things that you may or may not really need. Might come in handy, but you may never really need it. One of those types of things. And finally, you get what I call non-domain specific knowledge. What the heck is that, Brian? And I'm focusing specifically really here on technology, but it could also apply to things like project management, finance, banking, things like that are not domain specific in this case because we're talking about like a technical role like a Python developer, but there can be useful technologies related to being a Python developer that you don't really need to know. For instance, do you know how to use Java or Dart or Ruby? These are other languages. You don't really need to know those things to be a Python developer. Non-domain specific knowledge is where you should spend the least time. And that's kind of why I made this like a target and I put the non-domain specific knowledge to the side because it's really something you don't need to worry about much. Now let's take a practical example. What if you want to be a big data engineer? Now one thing I want to point out is I'm being pretty specific here, not just a data engineer, because data engineer could be somebody who works with small amounts of data like SQL Server or Oracle. Now we say small amount, but that's actually like a medium level amount of data compared to something like Apache Spark. So we're going to be more specific. I want to be a big data engineer and I want to focus on Spark. And by Spark, I'm including Databricks. But if you're working either on-prem or maybe in some sort of VMs in the cloud, you might be using just open source Spark. Since Databricks is really a service wrapper in the cloud around Spark, they're very closely related. So let's look at our core skills required. These are the things I would say you need to know. Now, I don't mean you got to know a little about this. I mean, you need to master these things. Do not move away from these subject areas when you have not mastered them. That would be a mistake. And I see people do this all the time. I want to go learn fabric. I'm going to learn this. No, focus. You know, Don't go squirrel, squirrel. You can't do that. You got to focus. Notice at the very first two points, I put in Databricks or Apache Spark. Depending which one of those two things is really a focus, 
you want to focus more on it. So if you're going to be working in Databricks in one of the three major clouds, then you want to focus on those skills, that ecosystem. And Databricks has a very large, extensive ecosystem. It's not only knowing languages, you have to learn how to use workflows and create notebooks that can take parameters and workflows and workflows that can call workflows, how to create your clusters, what you should choose when you're creating the clusters and how you choose those. So the size, the scale, the sharing options, there's all kinds of things, how to build dashboards. And if you're using Apache Spark, well, there's a lot of related tools there. You don't have as many built-in services. So you'll need to learn some notebooks probably to work with Apache Spark or some way you're developing your code. You might be using something like Zeppelin notebooks. You could be using Jupyter notebooks. It all depends on what you're trying to do. So you're gonna to have to have a little more flexibility in what your tool set is when you use Apache Spark because it doesn't give you as much out of the box. But regardless of which you're using, you need to know structured query language SQL. Spark SQL has been its own dialect, but recently there was an announcement that Spark SQL is going to be ANSI compliant, meaning it will be just like any other SQL, which is good, but you need to know it and learn it. You definitely need to know Python and you need to know it well if you're going to be working on Databricks or Apache Spark. And that means you need to understand PySpark and related features and libraries that go with that. Now I put R as a language in question mark because R is actually still very popular. And with a recent move by Databricks to create Spark Connect, it means that you can work with RStudio very easily and connect into the Databricks environment. And so to know R on Spark, you're gonna not only need to know the R language, but you're gonna need to know Sparkly R and Spark R. The libraries use R on Spark. You also, if you're doing Databricks, but in general nowadays, I'd say this is a really good idea, is to know at least one of the three major public clouds. So that's either AWS, Azure, or Google, because those really dominate the landscape. Also, you need to understand data warehousing and dimensional modeling. How do we design our data in a data warehouse? What Databricks calls, or Apache Spark calls, a lake house. To expand on that a little bit, not only do you need to understand data warehousing in a more traditional sense and dimensional modeling, also known as the star schema, but you need to understand how Apache Spark supports that, which is using data lakehouse, AKA Delta tables, and a bunch of things related to that. Again, so many things you need to master, but master those. Do not go outside of this target area until you really have mastered these things. And also relational databases. I added this kind of at the end. I find it to be extremely useful to understand relational databases and how to work with them. And many of the concepts from traditional relational databases like Postgres or SQL Server are being implemented in Apache Spark in a different sort of technological way, but conceptually very similar. I want to make one more point on this too, because I've had people in messaging and say, I've mastered Python. And I'm like, I've been using Python now for like eight years. I would not call myself a master of Python. I wish I could, but there are people who really know it, people who wrote the Python language and have books on it. And so I'm always learning and growing on Python and how to use it better. So be very careful not to fall into a trap where you learn something kind of lightly and you don't know how much you don't know. So you say, oh yeah, I know Python. I did a whole week of that. That's not mastering Python. So really focus on this. It will never hurt to add knowledge into your focus area. This red target area will always help you in your career, even if you don't think you really need it right away. But once we've mastered this, what's next to focus on? This is the sort of secondary and related things that you need to know if you were a big data engineer using Databricks or Spark, which is things like security concepts and ideally how to implement security on different platforms, the one that you will be developing on. Useful libraries, things that you would use that extend the capabilities of Python, but are not necessarily part of Core Python or Apache Spark. So maybe using things like DuckDB or Polars or other things that help you, but are not necessary on Databricks. And very closely at the heels of this are things like streaming. Streaming is something that you may or may not need to do if you are a big data engineer, but there's a good chance you will come across it pretty soon. Because of that, I do recommend that once you've mastered your core skills, look at things like Kafka, or if you're on Azure, for instance, Event Hub. Databricks has a good orchestration engine, the workflows I mentioned, but oftentimes companies find that the orchestration they require gets too complex to be supported just by workflows alone. And so they look to tools like Airflow or Dagster or Prefect or something along those lines. And those are powerful, complex in many cases, but things you might want to learn about once you get beyond your core skills. Now, AI is all the rage, and therefore, it's good to know about how to orchestrate and create sort of 
pipelines. You know, we have ETL pipelines as a data engineer, and we certainly need to understand ETL and how to do that really well. But we also are more and more getting involved in data science pipelines, which bring data in, featureize the data, clean it up and do all these things, train models, output models, and all the while, it's actually cataloging these things and tracking what they call artifacts, different parts of the model, even the statistical output. How well did the model do? Samples that it did, comparing different models that may have been attempted in a given training run. And that falls under MLOps. Definitely something would be good to know because obviously AI is becoming all the rage. But I will put a caution there. You do not need to be a data scientist. We can only do so much as a data engineer. So I do caution you not to try to do everything. Generally speaking, when people are going to custom train models, they will be data scientists and you would support them, hopefully. What about data ops, Brian? What is that? As we know, we have something called DevOps. And DevOps are to take applications from A to Z. We use a data ops process to create our applications, to maintain source code control, and then to deploy them across different environments. In a similar way, data ops is sort of DevOps for data. The idea is you've built your ETL process and all your different artifacts that might go into a Databricks environment like notebooks and workflows and on and on. And you need to have a way to move those from one environment to another in a consistent way that also supports configuration changes as you go from one environment to another. Now, Databricks actually has a few services related to that. One is the Databricks CLI. The other one is their REST API. And there's also something called Databricks Asset Bundles. So those are a few things that I don't think I'd focus on too much as part of your core knowledge. But pretty quickly, that's a good thing to learn because you're going to be involved in that. And notice the title I'm using is Big Data Engineer, not Architect. If you're an architect, you're going to have to know a lot more about this outer orange circle. But a big data engineer, somebody who's relatively new to this, would probably not be expected to have a mastery of the orange area, but needs to have a good foundation in the red. And finally, they saw that these ancillary tools, things like using app dev tools like Streamlit, or if something has nothing to do with Python, really Flutter, these can be useful. They're great if you want to sort of showcase your skills and put an app out that showcases how you do visualizations and train AI models and things. So Streamlit's wonderful for that, but it's not really going to be required probably in your job. And Flutter is an app development framework developed by Google. Also, you see things like Terraform and Tofu. And I didn't mention, I kind of skipped over cloud infrastructure related services, but this is a perfect time to combine these. So as a data engineer, whatever platform you're on, you do have to understand how the infrastructure is provisioned. Typically in a cloud environment, in my experience, they'll have some team, if it's a larger company, and their responsibility is to consistently and securely provision resources like storage, like VNets, databases, maybe key vaults for security purposes, things like that. That would be typically a team that does that kind of infrastructure. And the related services, of course, you would need to know how to use in the orange area would be like databases and storage, et cetera, that you can read and write to. Getting into the actual provisioning would get into things like Terraform. And since Terraform just went closed source and they don't support open source anymore, you can use Open Tofu if you want to stay with the open source side of it. But that allows provisioning in cloud environments or elsewhere of resources, typically not something a data engineer would need to do, but possibly could. Training the AI models, I mentioned, that's really more of a data scientist job. So I'd say don't worry too much about that. And what about visualizations, Brian? Don't I need to be a Power BI expert if I work on Azure? No, and I really want to be careful about this because this is a decision point I had to make. Power BI came along and it got really popular. And I had to really wrestle with myself. Do I want to go into the Power BI space and focus on that? That's a different role. So I've made a conscious decision that I want to focus on the data architecture and engineering. And that means I can't master Power BI completely. I like to dig into it. I know quite a bit. I'm particularly strong when it comes to the tabular model and then how to model the data. But when it gets into the you know telling stories with data, there are people who do that better and have a mastery of that. And that is itself a whole different target here, right? A whole different chart of what you need to focus on. And Tableau falls into that sort of same space. Now, if you're looking at something like Fabric, where does that fit in, Brian? If you are a Power BI developer, I'd say you probably should add Fabric to your core area or very closely, maybe the orange area. Fabric is new. We really don't know where it's going. Microsoft could get rid of it next year. Despite all the hype, you don't know. It happens. Therefore, in the Power BI space, because Fabric is so integrated with Power BI, and it's such a useful service when you're doing Power BI reporting, I think it's worth knowing if you were a Power BI developer. But as a data engineer, its future is still uncertain, and I don't see Fabric replacing Databricks or Snowflake anytime soon, despite all the hype. 
these other services are much more extensive and have many more features to support secure productionized pipelines. So let's talk about non-domain specific knowledge. So just as an example, Java, Go, Rust, whatever, all these languages, they're not relevant to this particular type of job, big data engineer. Django, Flask, etc. Now I'm loving Django and I'm doing a lot with Django. I'm tempted to do a series on Django just because I've been getting into it so much lately. But I recognize that I'm crossing into the app developer space, which is fine, but it's not what a data engineer does. Could come in handy. Maybe I'll hit a project somewhere where they say we really need someone who can do the data engineering from Django and I'll be there. But right now I haven't seen that. So Django is an app development framework built and used in Python. And Flask is a lightweight web development framework. So they're two different extremes of the same thing. Django is kind of an all-inclusive, batteries included framework. And Flask is a very lightweight, basic web development framework. And here's where I've got to be extra cautious because I think people think, oh, I'm a big data engineer. I better know all these big data platforms. And it's not feasible. You're actually going to have to nail down what platform you intend to focus on to be a big data engineer. So is it going to be Databricks? Is it going to be open source Apache Spark? That one you can kind of bridge and do a little of both, I think. But it's not practical to say I'm going to be a big query one and I'm going to know this one and that one and I'm going to do Databricks. It's just too wide and deep a stack of tools to do that. So if you're not a big query big data engineer, then I wouldn't focus on big query. Synapse, I'm not really sure what the future is, but again, it's a different tool set. I wouldn't focus much on that either. Uh, I did almost forget to mention, what about Azure Data Factory? Azure Data Factory is probably something I'd put in the orange area if you work on Azure, but it is a very specific cloud tool. So if you're not focused on the Azure platform, it may or not be useful. I have found that I can usually get through fine using just workflows and I haven't really had the need to use Azure Data Factory, but many places do. And finally, Power Apps is just an example. A lot of people hype up, I gotta learn Power Apps and there were channels and everything. And it seemed like Power Apps in terms of being promoted kind of died down for a while. And then recently got a little bit of a surge again. But my advice is don't worry about Power Apps at all. It's not relevant to a big data engineer job. Might be nice conversationally, but you're not gonna probably use it. That's it this time. So I wanna thank you. Please like, share, subscribe, tell your neighbors about my channel. And until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.